we were discussing about uh, probability distributions in the previous class so we'll continue our discussion around it probability it seems to me by uh, from the previous lecture that almost all of you have seen some of this stuff before so i guess this is more of a recall than something new that we are talking about but for those of you especially in the online section if you haven't taken a course in probability then i'm assuming some of the stuff you are seeing here is new so we talked about bernoulli and binomial distribution in the previous class uh let's talk about the third distribution which is geometric and this is uh here omega is n and basically the x of omega is first time an event happens first time a success first time success is recorded okay so i have iid process so remember we were discussing this particular example that i'm supposed to finish 10000 steps every day that's my goal and so the probability that i'll finish 10000 steps today is p and the same probability is to is there tomorrow and day after tomorrow and so on so every day i wake up and there is a probability p through which i will be able to finish the 10000 steps so geometric distribution is measuring when is the first time so start of the month you know i'm i'm standing on day 1 of the month what is the first date on which i am going to complete the 10000 steps and the way to the way the distribution goes the probability that x is equal to k is given by 1 minus p raised to k minus 1 times p where p is the probability of success If you want to figure out what is the expected value is I think the the expression is simple you want to start from k equals 0 to infinity remember omega o oh, omega is n union 0 so all the natural numbers and including 0 as well so k goes from 0 to infinity k times 1 minus p raised to k minus 1 p that's the expected value of x you can also compute the variance i don't know what this thing sums to but uh, i'm sure you guys might have studied uh, how to compute series like this how do you compute the summation of series like this so you can recall from those discussions and hopefully you can compute what this expected value looks like you can of course uh, refer to wikipedia wikipedia has a lot of information about these distributions so you can always refer to them if you want to know what the expected value expression looks like <coughs> where else do you see geometric distribution where where else do you have some uh some event which has a certain probability p of happening and then you want to know when is the first day that event happens when is the first time that event is going to happen any other example that comes to your mind an event that is i uh, like 
every day that event, uh, the probability of that event happening or the probability of success is uh, P. Any other example that comes to your mind? So let's say a doctor is uh, seeing patients and the doctor is administering drugs to the patient. I mean, there are patients coming with similar disease. And then every day uh, one patient comes and the doctor has administers the drug and then measures whether the drug was successful or not. And uh, there is a probability P from with which that drug will be successful on a patient. So the first time the patient is, uh, is, uh, is uh, treated uh, with the drug. So that's also a something like this because every time a patient comes then it's a, it's a, new, prob uh, uh, it's a new event. And so in that particular event, whether success will get recorded or not, that's my X of omega. And so again, the probability there is going to be this, where P is the probability that the patient will get treated with the drug that the doctor is administering. So, uh, yeah, in networking also, you know, when is the packet successfully transmitted? If the probability of P, if P is the probability of successfully transmitting the packet, so you're sending packets at every point of time, but at some point of time, the packet will be successfully delivered. So that's also uh, something that's modeled using geometric distribution. So geometric distribution appears in a lot of different situations. The reason why we are studying these distributions will become very clear when we talk about hypothesis testing. So we will get back to these distributions in different contexts. Poisson distribution. Here, omega is again 0 union n. Probability that x is equal to k is given by lambda raised to k e raised to minus lambda over k factorial. Here, x of omega is the number of customers in, uh, I don't know, Panera bread. in one hour. So I pick 12 to 1 p.m. Let's say that's my time, time slot. And I'm looking at how many customers are coming to Panera Bread between 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, and uh, that is basically a Poisson distributed random variable. Lambda is known as the rate. And here I think the expected value is uh, equal to lambda. If I'm not mistaken, expected value of x is lambda. I'll very quickly check and let you know. Yeah, mean is lambda. Okay. Turns out the variance is also lambda. So uh, this one also happens, number of uh, people checking their email between 4 to 5 p.m. So I see one person is checking, <coughs> no, two people are checking their email. So, uh, 
So Poisson distribution is number of people checking their email between 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, in the university. So that's also Poisson distributed. Uh, number of packets arriving uh, on a server between a specific time interval, that's also Poisson distributed. Uh, so in each of these cases, what happens is independent people or independent uh, servers are making their decisions about whether to send the packet or not. Uh, individual people are deciding whether to go to Panera Bread or not. Individual people are deciding whether to check email or not. All of these different situations are uh, cases where independent decisions are being made, but there is one specific server or one specific Panera Bread or one specific uh, email server that is basically receiving all these requests. And so Poisson distribution tells you how exactly how many requests are being made uh, within a specific time interval when independent requests are being made by different decision makers. Um, now, suppose there is a server, and that is, uh, let's say, consider the Ohio State University's email server, and assume that, well, right now Ohio State doesn't uh, manage that email server, now Microsoft manages those email servers, but at some point of time, Ohio State was managing that email server. And let's say the, number of requests between 4 to 5 p.m. was 1,000 requests. So 1,000 students, faculty, staff of Ohio State University were accessing their email between uh, 10 to, uh, between 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, so sometimes, of course, when I say 1,000, what I mean is that lambda equals 2,000. Uh, so on an average, 1,000 people are checking. Sometimes it's 900 people, sometimes it's 1,100 people. On one occasion, if there are 1,500 people accessing the server, what does that imply? If there are 1,500 people or 1,600 people that are accessing the server, what would you, as in, let's say you are the person managing that email server, how would you treat this particular event? What might be happening? Usage. Sorry? Yeah, peak usage, but why might that be happening? So typically you generally see like 1,000 people to be checking their email between 4 to 5 p.m. On one occasion, you're seeing 1,500 people are checking their email server, checking their emails. What does that imply? So it could imply there is some event happening at the university and a lot of people are checking for their tickets or checking for whatever, something related to that particular event. It could also imply that uh, it's just a random situation that has emerged, like there's no event that is correlating all this checking of emails. Uh, it could also imply that an attacker is trying to steal many people's password. So it's trying different, different passwords on that email server and trying to figure out which password is the correct password. And, uh, and so that could be an attack on the system. So that's why you want to know for every, in each of these situations, you want to know what exactly are the mean value, what exactly is the distribution, so that when there is an attack happening, you can actually try to detect a change in distribution, a change in expected value, a change in variance, and so on, in order to detect the attack. So, I'm always going to uh, uh, talk about this particular thing in uh, various contexts because I think it's an important part to remember. Uh, there are two things to remember. One is it's very difficult to detect an attack because you don't know if it's a legitimate traffic or illegitimate traffic, if it's a fault or if it's an actual attack. And so we need to have a lot of toolboxes in order to be able to say with some sort of certainty that this is actually an attack and not something that is uh, happening randomly. And sometimes you may be wrong, but the hope is that most of the times you are right. And we can talk about you know, what the trade-offs between being right and wrong are, which we will talk about it in maybe four, three or four classes later. So these are all the uh, discrete distributions that I wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, so by discrete distributions, what I mean is that omega takes only discrete values. So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. 
Now I want to talk, talk about continuous value distribution. uniform here omega is interval a to b it could be open interval it could be closed interval and instead of talking about probability of x is equal to k i have to give a interval i have already used a and b so let me put it a bar b bar and I'm assuming A is less than or equal to A bar is less than or equal to B bar is less than or equal to B. A bar to B bar, one over B minus A dx. This thing inside the integral is known as probability density function. And I'm going to denote it by f of x. So in this case, f of x, 1 over b minus a, for a less than equal to x less than equal to b and 0 otherwise. So in this case, in the case of discrete distribution, this is known as a probability mass function, PMF. In this case, it is known as a probability density function, PDF. And we generally denote it by F, so don't confuse this with the state equation F. But we'll be using F for both the purposes. Um, so most of the people use F for denoting probability density function. In the case of uniform distribution, the density function is given by this. Remember that omega is actually between A and B only. So in case, uh, uh, technically we don't really need this clause, but sometimes people have uh, distribution defined over the entire minus infinity to plus infinity and they just add a positive value between A and B and they keep it zero otherwise. So both of them are completely fine. In this case, I have defined omega to be only between A and B, not the entire real line. Any questions so far? on uniform distribution. You can compute the mean value of uniform distribution by just putting x here and then changing it from a to b and that will give you the mean value of the uniform distribution. Typically it's 1 over b minus a. Is it 1 over b minus a? What's the mean value? Yeah, I think it is that. OK. Any, can I, I'll erase this side. Actually, let's just compute the mean value here for the uniformly distributed random variable. So expected value of x is equal to integral x 1 over b minus a dx. What do I get? 1 over b minus a. x square over 2 a to b b square minus a square over 
addition and everything. Right. And that's equal to B plus A over 2. Perfect. That's exactly what the mean value is. Awesome. You can compute the covariance exactly in this particular fashion. The next distribution is exponential. Omega is between zero and infinity. The f of y is given by or rather f of x. One over beta e raised to minus x over beta. Where beta is a positive number. Where do we use uh, exponential distribution? So exponential is typically when two people are making decisions independently, exponential distribution is measuring the time in between their decision making activity. So for instance, you sit in Panera Bread and you look at what time people are coming inside Panera Bread. So you look at what time the gate was opened. Okay, and you will have T0, T1, T2, T3. So if you look at the difference between those time intervals, so if you look at T1 minus T0, T2 minus T1, T3 minus T2, and so on, they all will be exponentially distributed. Okay, so inter-arrival time between two customers is generally exponentially distributed. Uh, we have seen this in the taxi, so if you look at Uber, for instance, how many people are calling Uber in the city of Columbus? Like, it's not like how many people are calling, so Uber gets a request for a customer's a customer request right now, and then they get a customer request two time step, I mean whatever, certain. So they get a customer request at T0, then they get a request at T1, then they get a request at T2. If you look at the difference, that inter-arrival time, that is exponentially distributed. So we have seen it in taxi, we have seen it is in uh, Panera Bread, it could be the case in call centers as well. So in a lot of these situations, the inter-arrival time is exponentially distributed. I'm trying to think what other example would be exponentially distributed. <coughs> Anyways, yeah. I think inter-arrival time generally, x is inter-arrival time. between customers. That is the same as the small x, right? Yeah, yeah, it's the same as the small x. So generally, uh, the convention in probability is that small x denotes a value and capital X denotes a random variable. So remember I write capital X of omega and small x is just a value. Because the expression doesn't contain the random variable, so. Correct, that's why I've written it as x, because it's a value. Right. This is the value f evaluated at this point. And then this x is a random variable, which is inter-arrival time between customers. So I use capital X always in expectation and in probability, probability. 
but then this is actually it doesn't look like a small x but this one is actually a bigger x and this is a small x so it's just that i have not written it properly okay the next is uh, gaussian distribution which is a very important distribution here omega is the entire real axis uh, we have mean mu uh, the mean is mu variance is sigma square and then the f of x is given by x minus mu square over 2 sigma square. So this is the famous Gaussian distribution. It is generally denoted by x is distributed this cursive n of mu and sigma square. So I will use this notation quite often uh, because uh, a lot of the stuff that we'll be doing will require Gaussian distribution. So uh, we'll say that x, random variable x, is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution with mean mu and variance sigma square. And this is the probability density function of the Gaussian distribution. So whenever you are given probability density function, the way to compute the probability that x is in an interval is just replace this with fx. It'll give you the probability uh, of the event. Any question so far? Eighth is multivariate. <coughs> Gaussian distribution. Here's the mean omega is equal to R. Okay, let me pick R n for now. So the mean is mu in Rn, covariance is sigma, which is a positive definite matrix. So it has to be symmetric and all its eigenvalues has to be greater than zero. So that's a covariance matrix. probability density function here is given by and you don't need to remember this but 2 pi raised to k determinant of sigma minus 1 over 2 x minus mu transpose sigma inverse 
x minus mu. So because we need the sigma inverse here and we need determinant of sigma in the denominator, we want sigma to be a positive definite matrix. Okay, so you know, coming back to the temperature example, so if you're looking at the temperature of this room, we have a Gaussian distributed random variable which is a scalar quantity. But if you look at the temperature of all the rooms in this building, and this building might have like hundreds of rooms, 100 rooms, so I have n equals to 100 here because I have 100 rooms, so I have 100 temperature readings. There is definitely a mean temperature reading, so that's the temperature of every room, the average temperature of every room. There is a covariance, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about covariance, uh, uh, like for correlated random variables, what happens, uh, what, what's exactly the covariance is. So we'll talk about it in a bit, but basically this particular matrix captures what the relationship between the temperature of this room with respect to the temperature of some other room is. Okay, so that's measured by the covariance matrix, and we'll talk about it, maybe not today, but maybe uh, in the next class, when we talk about dependent random variables. So this captures the dependency between two, temperature of two rooms. And then the probability density function is given by this particular expression, this long expression. Uh, notice that the term inside is actually a scalar quantity, because it's vector transpose matrix times a vector. So this one's scalar, and this one is scalar as well, so it's determinant of sigma. And because sigma is positive definite, this quantity is uh, positive, and this quantity is uh, also valid, like the sigma, the matrix is invertible here, because it's positive definite. So multivariate Gaussian is gonna play a huge role in our discussion about uh, attack detection, because many a times, let's consider the following scenario, you have a vehicle, and the vehicle has four wheels, and each of those wheels have rotation sensors. Then, basically what you have is n equals to four. You get four different readings uh, about the, so mean, mean would not mean much because in this particular case, only if you're driving at a constant speed, the rotation sensors will have a specific mean. Otherwise, the mean will be changing as you are driving and changing the velocity of the vehicle. But assuming you are coasting, you're, you're, you're driving at exactly the same speed, then you will have a mean uh, rotational velocity, you will have covariance, and if one of the rotational sensors are attacked, you will be able to detect it by checking the covariance matrix of, uh, like the updated covariance matrix. If you see that the covariance matrix is, if the mean is different or the covariance is different, then you know that one of the sensor, one of the rotation sensors have been attacked. So, uh, so this particular term, this multivariate Gaussian will be extremely important when we talk about attack detection. So we'll get, come back to this particular expression again and again throughout the course. Chi-square distribution. It's called chi-square, so this symbol is known as chi and then chi-square distribution. Uh, so suppose I have random variables. So this omega is also 0 to infinity. And I have like 
x1, no, x1 is already used. So I'm going to define my x as z1 square plus z2 square plus zk square, where each of these zi is standard Gaussian. This is called a normal distribution or a standard Gaussian, so mean zero, variance one. So I'm getting data and I'm looking at, uh, I'm summing the, uh, the square of the data. I get the random variable x and this is chi-square distributed. This is the probability density function of this particular uh, random variable. And this k, this k and this k is the same. Okay, they are the same k. Okay, so where, where is this particular distribution used? So let's say, let's say the temperature is uh, Y. Um, y1, Y2, Yk. So at every one minute, I'm going to measure the temperature of this room at the thermostat. And then I know that the average temperature of the room is 72 degrees Fahrenheit because that's what we have been talking about since the first day of the class. So I'm going to define my zi as yi minus 72 over sigma. So sigma is the, covari the covariance of uh, the temperature in the room. So 72 is my mean temperature, sigma is the Let's say the sigma is equal to 1. So the temperature varies between 71 to 73 most of the time. So the sigma would be somewhere around 1. So my, uh, I, com conduct, I com compute another random variable zi, which is yi, which is the current temperature minus 72 divided by sigma. And then I square each of these, each of these readings and I add it up. I get x and x will be distributed according to this particular expression. Okay, because this is a standard Gaussian random variable. Assuming that the temperature of this room is uh, distributed according to a Gaussian random variable. So that's where this particular uh, chi-square distribution will be used in the class, wherein uh, we'll be taking some reading, which is supposed to be Gaussian distribute, distributed. We will subtract the mean from that reading. We'll divide it by the covariance, uh, square root of the covariance, we get a standard normal distribution, which is zi, and then I'm going to take the square of this number, add it up, and I get x, and that will be chi-square distributed. So, and then the last distribution I want to talk about is Wishart distribution. which is a generalization of uh, chi-square distribution. Here, omega is the set of all matrices
set of all positive definite matrices. That's what omega is. I, I want to make sure I write it correctly. So uh, this sigma, this is p-dimensional, p-dimensional random vector, or rather Gaussian vector. Each of these zi are elements in uh, Rp. And then I compute x as summation zi, zi transpose i goes from 1 to n. So I have n random variables. n random vectors and I take zi, zi transpose, add it all up. I get Wishart distribution. So x is distributed. This x is said to be distributed according to the Wishart distribution with parameter p, sigma n. Remember that this x is actually in R, sorry, p cross p. Uh, I need to, well, I'll change some something here. Sorry, I'm going to change this to p cross p. Because this is a p-dimensional matrix, so this is a p cross p-dimensional matrix. So this x is in R p cross p. And there are n, n random variables that you are adding up. So this x is in Rp cross p. And remember that this is a positive, n, n should be greater than p. So then it's a positive definite matrix. p minus 1, yeah. So if n is greater than p minus 1, then this is a positive definite matrix with high probability and uh, the density function is actually very complicated. So I'm going to write it, but uh, make sure that, uh, I, I mean, it doesn't matter if you write it or not because we will not be uh, needing this a lot, <coughs> but we will allude to it sometime during the class. Oh, I didn't say what this function is. This is gamma function. So don't worry about noting it down. Uh, you know, just let it be. Uh, when we get to this particular function later on in the class for attack detection, then we'll, we'll write it again in the classroom, but uh, it's not that important. I think the only thing, the only thing that you should be uh, careful about, so we are computing, we are constructing a matrix here x, we are computing the determinant, there is this trace operator here, so everybody knows what a matrix trace is. 
traces the sum of diagonal elements of a matrix. So there is a trace operator here, and then there is a bunch of variables in the denominator as well. Okay, so where is this Wishart distribution getting utilized? So let's consider this building, right? So here we were talking about, remember in the chi-square, we were talking about temperature of this room. I subtract the mean divided by sigma, I get the chi-square distributed random variable. Now let's not look at one room, let's look at this entire building. So I have 100 rooms here, so my P equals to 100. I'm measuring the temperature, subtracting the mean from the temperature, so my mean is zero. So this is the temperature of every room minus the mean of the temperature of every room. So I get mean zero, covariance sigma, random variable. And then I look at that, the, that variable and take the ZI, ZI transpose of this minute, next minute, next to next minute, next to next minute, and so on. I have like a total of n such readings, and I construct this matrix capital X then that capital X is actually distributed according to the Wishart random variable. I mean, it's not a variable actually, it's matrix. So this omega is the set of all positive definite matrices because this X is supposed to be a positive definite matrix. N must be greater than or equal to P. So then X becomes a positive definite matrix and then it's distributed according to this particular random variable. Okay, uh, all of these distributions will be used for detecting attacks on, uh, on systems. So if you want to detect the attack on the entire building, you will use Wishart distribution. It, if you want to detect the attack only of this particular room, you will use chi-square distribution. And there are tests for checking whether the distribution, whether the Wishart distribution has changed or not, or the chi-square distribution has changed or not. So those are the tests that will allow us to conclude whether or not an attack is happening on the building or on the system. Typically, when you look at, do you know that there is a generator right next door? There is a generator next to our pack. Have you guys seen the generator? Right? So all of those generators, they need to be monitored for cyber attacks. Buildings need to be monitored for cyber attacks. So all of these attacks, you use one of these distributions and try to check for changes in the distribution to detect whether an attack is happening or not. So it'll all be very useful in some time. Okay. Any questions so far on these distributions? So what we have studied today, I'm not going to uh, take more time. So what we have studied today, um, so far we have studied about this set omega, the set of all uncertainty, we have talked about events. Uh, then we talked about uh, uh, probability measures, expected value, covariance. Then we went into specific examples of distribution. So we have talked about 10 distributions, out of which four distributions were on discrete variables, and six distributions have been on uh, uh, real uh, variables, or Rn cross n, in this case, Rp cross p. So we have talked about a whole bunch of distributions. What I've tried to convey is different problem statements, different situations will call for a different distribution. So we know, we know 10 distributions, all these 10 distributions are important. And depending on the situation, whether you are looking at a traffic on the server, whether you are looking at number of customers entering a specific place, or whether you are looking at a temperature reading of an entire building, you will be looking at different distributions of uh, uh, different distributions and, and that's why I think knowing these distributions is important, how these distributions were, uh, like what's the underlying reason for these distributions is important. And in the next class, we'll talk about joint random variables, conditional random variable, con joint distribution, conditional distribution and marginals. And then we'll talk about uh, uh, filtering. So we'll talk about joint. 
So joint uh, Gaussian is something that I'll, I'll spend an entire class on talking about joint Gaussian distribution because that becomes a cornerstone for coming up with Kalman filter. So then we'll talk about filtering. And then we'll talk about robust uh, statistics. So how do you come up with uh, some, something related to the statistics and how do you make sure that your uh, measurements are robust to errors? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'm planning to have a guest lecture by the person who manages the cybersecurity of this entire uh, university buildings. So he'll come and talk to you about what all are the important considerations when one thinks about cybersecurity of a very large set of buildings, thermal management of a large set of buildings. So he'll spend some time talking to you guys about it. That will happen most likely next week. So once I schedule it, I'll send out the information about when he's going to be talking in the class. So that's all. Thank you. Yeah, you have a question? How do we know which kind of uh, distribution we should use? Um, so that's why I'm giving you examples so that you, you have, you register it in your mind. Whenever you see a situation, you will know that, okay, this looks like it's going to be Poisson distribution or it looks like it's going to be a geometric distribution. It's difficult to know a priori, right? There is no such guideline. But when I say that, okay, number of customers coming to Panera Bread sounds very similar to number of email server accesses by people in the university. And so, if Panera Bread customers are coming according to Poisson distribution, then most likely the email accesses on the servers are also coming according to a Poisson distribution. Um, is there any indicator that we can know we apply on the right distribution or not? So, okay, very good question. So, when you go to work, most likely people, like when you are a junior employee in a company, let's say you go to Honeywell and you work in their cybersecurity division, most likely somebody there will tell you that this distribution is going to be Gaussian or this distribution is going to be Poisson. Now, of course, if you take courses in statistics department, they actually tell you that given the random variable, how do you know what distribution it is? So there are test statistics and then you construct test statistics to test whether it's Poisson distribution or whether it's geometric distribution and so on. So there, are, there is like a whole field of statistics that's devoted to that particular area. So either you take that course, which tells you exactly what, given the random variables, what exactly is the distribution, so you can take that course. Or in some cases, when you are a junior employee, somebody else will tell you that this is what the statistics going to look like. When you become senior, you kind of have some tribal knowledge of that area. Like, okay, if you're looking at temperature sensor, it's going to have a lot of thermal noise, and thermal noise generally appear as Gaussian distributed random variable. Uh, but it's going to be different for different. So wind farm, for instance, you know, if you're looking at the wind, how much, how much energy is being generated by wind farm every hour, and you plot that curve, that's going to look like a viable distribution. But we didn't talk about viable distribution here, right? So it really depends from system to system. And, uh, uh, and so, so somebody within that, within that, uh, tribe will tell you what that distribution is going to look like. Um, otherwise, take a course in statistics. <laughs> All right, thank you so much.